Oh, well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming and especially warm welcome to those who have never been to one of these lectures before. And the usual format is that I talk for about 45, 50 minutes and that leaves hopefully about 10 minutes for questions. I, I don't know if there'll be any answers, but it'll leave time for questions anyway. And what I want to do is to talk this day about how the work in algebra of two mathematicians who were based in Ireland, as it turns out, led to breaches of some of the fundamental laws of numbers that hold universally in arithmetic. And their work freed algebra from the constraints of arithmetic and led to the invention of new algebras. And these two people were, on the left, William Rowan Hamilton, and he revolutionised algebra with his discovery of quaternions, which are a non-commutative algebraic system, as well as work that he did on complex numbers. And on the left, you see um, the formula that I'll be talking about a lot later on, that ij is not equal to ji, but is equal to minus j, a, j, j times i. Right. And on the right-hand side, we've got George Bull, and he contributed to many areas of mathematics, as did um, Hamilton. Um, he contributed to probability, differential equations, and his greatest achievement was to create an algebra of logic, now called Boolean algebra. And these new algebras were not only important to the develop of, development of algebra itself, but remain of current use. There are various practical implications, for example, quaternions in computer graphics. And I'm also going to look at the work of the American mathematician and engineer Claude Shannon, who applied Boole's symbolic logic to problems of electrical circuit switching. So I'll look at Hamilton first, then at Bull, and it's possible to consider them separately because although they were both based in Ireland, Bull was based in Cork, Hamilton based in Dublin, they strangely had very little interaction or communication given their stature in the mathematical world and their common areas of interest. So William Rowan Hamilton, I'll give a little biography first of all, was undoubtedly the most important Irish mathematician who worked in Ireland. Recognition came in his own lifetime, as he was elected shortly before his death, first in the list of foreign associates of the newly formed American National Academy of Sciences. These associates were, in the view of the Academy, the most important scientists working outside the United States of America. And although Hamilton had performed world-class research in geometrical optics, as well as in dynamical systems, it was his work in quaternions that won him recognition from the National Academy. Hamilton was born in Dublin in 1805 and was a child prodigy with the legend that by the age of 13 he could speak as many languages. One of his biographers, Sean O'Donnell, has analysed this claim and comes up with a more modest assessment that he knew Latin, Greek and Hebrew well enough to read them easily, with lesser facility to read French, German and Italian, and that his knowledge of Persian, Syriac, Syriac Sanskrit and Chaldi seemed to have been more modest. <laughs> and interestingly, O'Donnell also says that Hamilton seemed to have claimed no knowledge of Gaelic, the language spoken by half the population of Ireland at the time. Hamilton was educated by his uncle, James, with an emphasis on classics, although he showed remarkable calculating ability from a very early age. But by the time he was preparing for entrance to Trinity College Dublin, his preference for mathematics and science were becoming clearer as he indicates in a letter to his sister Eliza. One thing only have I to regret in the direction of my studies, that they should be diverted, or rather rudely forced, by the college course from their natural bent and favourite channel. That bent, you know, is science. Science in its most exalted heights, in its most secret recesses. It has so captivated me, so seized on my affections, that my attention to classical studies is an effort and an irksome one. And this is the way he writes when he's a teenager. And he continued writing. You know, I'll give you another quotation later on. He continues writing in that, that method all through his life. He took first place in the entrance examination for Trinity the following year, quickly scaling the academic ladder and becoming Professor of Astronomy an Astronomer Royal of Ireland at the age of 22 before he even graduated. So that's something for the college students in the audience to try to emulate. 
and I don't want you to think that this talk is sponsored by the Irish Tourist Board, but at the top we've got a panorama taken from inside Trinity College Dublin. Dunsink Observatory below was Hamilton's home as the Andrews Professor of Astronomy and Royal Astronomer of Ireland. And the observatory is situated on the highest point to the northwest of Dublin, about eight kilometres from the city centre. Hamilton discovered quaternions while walking to Dublin from Dunsink on the 16th of October 1843, and this is celebrated annually with a commemorative walk. Just want to say a little bit about his first work, which was mainly on geometrical optics and dynamics. In 1832, he obtained international recognition when he predicted that a ray of light incident on a biaxial crystal in a certain direction would be refracted into a cone of rays and emerge as a hollow cylinder. A biaxial crystal is a crystal with certain optical symmetries. So in this slide here, you see the ray of light coming down at a certain angle, being refracted into a cone, this is a cone inside the crystal, and then emerging as a hollow cone. Now the point about this is that this was totally unexpected. In fact, people hadn't worked with these biaxial crystals before. It was a totally unexpected prediction. It took his colleague Humphrey Lloyd, Professor of Natural Philosophy at Dublin, a couple of months to obtain the suitable crystal. And when he did so, uh, Hamilton's prediction was verified. And it's one of those infrequent occasions when a theoretical investigation predicted previously unknown physical behaviour. Well, Hamilton's work was very theoretical, very abstract, and the formulation that he made of mechanics, based on the principle of least action, was the one approach to classical mechanics that carried over to quantum mechanics. And for many systems, the function known as the Hamiltonian, it's the total energy of the system, and it's used in both classical and quantum mechanics to discuss the evolution of a system over time. So the dynamical work that he did is the work for which he's mainly known these days, but I'll be talking about the quaternionic work. Hamilton was knighted during the 1835 meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science held in Dublin. Subsequently, he was president of the Royal Irish Academy and, <clears throat> as mentioned, was elected the first foreign member of the National Academy of Sciences. So I want to talk now about Hamilton's quaternions. He discovered in 1843 after 15 years' work, so don't get disheartened, and on which he spent most of his efforts during the remaining 22 years of his life. But I think it would be useful if I said something about complex or imaginary numbers, first of all, because they're very instructive when we come to dealing with quaternions. So let's look at the square root of minus 1 and ask ourselves, what could that be? Well, it certainly cannot be a real number. Since every real number, positive or negative, gives a positive result when squared. So the square root of minus 1 can't be a real number. And in fact, many mathematicians in the 18th century, for example, the great Euler, um, worked with this type of number a great deal, said, of such numbers we may truly assert that they are neither nothing, nor greater than nothing, nor less than nothing, which necessarily constitutes them imaginary or impossible. And even in the 19th century, the century I'm talking about with Hamilton, Hamilton and Bull, there was still a great deal of unhappiness about the complex numbers. For example, Augustus de Morgan, Professor of Math Mathematics at University College in London, declared, We have shown the symbol, the square root of minus one, to be void of meaning, or rather self-contradictory and absurd. But however strange complex numbers were, they were of great use, for example, in solving quadratic and other equations, and in many other areas of mathematics. So just want to say a little bit about them in order to introduce some things about quaternions when we come to that in a couple of slides. So suppose we formally just try to calculate with com uh, complex numbers, the square root of minus 1, and we find out that addition is easy because we want to add 2 plus 3 times the square root of minus 1 to 4 plus 5 times the square root of minus 1. Then you add the 2 to the 4 and you add the 3 to the 5 to get 6 plus 8 times the square root of minus 1. And so is multiplication. As long as we follow the rule that the square root of minus 1, whenever we meet it, multiplied by the square root of minus 1, we replace by minus 1. As long as we adopt that formalism. 
and I've got an example written down in the slide that you can do and work on on your way home where we multiply those two, 2 plus 3 times root minus 1 multiplied by 4 plus 5 times root minus 1 and you multiply it out two terms, a binomial term times a binomial term so there'll be four products when you multiply it out and you collect the products together using the fact that root minus 1 times root minus 1 is minus 1. So you operate with them in a formal way like that. Now, uh, just a little bit of notation. Um, we call the compound thing a plus b root minus 1 a complex number with a being the real part and b being the imaginary part. And then just some notation, which will be helpful in a minute, we usually use the letter i to denote the square root of minus 1. So i squared is equal to minus 1. Now, there was a way of looking at them uh, which went back to 1799 to uh, Danish navigator Caspar Vessel and in his representation of complex numbers, a geometric representation, he used what was called the complex plane. Two axes are drawn at right angles, the real axis, the imaginary axis, and you can see there I've written down or shown two complex numbers, the one where you go two units in the real direction and three units in the imaginary and another where you go four units in the real direction and five units in the imaginary. But what did Hamilton do? And in hindsight, it seems very obvious and is now generally accepted. Hamilton asked the question, is there any algebraic representation of complex numbers? Right. Um, Vessel had a geometrical, or the organ diagram as it's usually called now, um, had a geometrical representation. So. Hamilton is asking, is there any other algebraic representation of complex numbers that reveal all valid operations on them? And the answer, as I say, with hindsight, is very obvious. He defined a complex number as a pair of real numbers. A complex, if, you, if you're happy enough with real numbers, then you're probably happy enough with a couple of them. And complex numbers are just a couple. Any one complex number is a couple of real numbers. What we have to do now is to say how to add and multiply couples. And addition of couples is easy enough. You just add them pairwise, A, B, added on to C, D, gives you the couple A plus C, comma, B plus D. So you combine two couples in that way there. Multiplication is less straightforward, more complicated looking. If you take the couple A, B and the couple C, D, then you combine them to get the couple whose first entry is AC minus BD and AD plus BC. Right, so one can do that easily, um, straightforwardly. You may ask why, um, but you can do that and there's nothing imaginary or mysterious about it. You're just dealing with couples of numbers and you have a way of adding them and you've got a way of uh, multiplying them. That's all straightforward. Now we do an association with what we had in the earlier slides. We associate the pair A0, where the second entry is 0. We associate that to the real number A, and we associate the couple 0, 1, where the first entry is 0 and the second entry is 1. We associate that to the number I. And the reason is that if you apply my rule for multiplication on the previous slide to the couple 0, 1 multiplied by the couple 0, 1, you end up with the couple minus one, zero. That rule of multiplication combines zero, one with zero, one under multiplication to minus one, zero. And then under our correspondence, that can be written as i squared equals minus one. So what we've got is the complex numbers consists of all pairs of real numbers with a certain way of adding them, a certain way of multiplying them. You can think of the first entry of the pair as the real number, the second entry as the imaginary number, and then it's got all the characteristics that you want to have to happen. So the way to think of this at the back of your mind or the front of your mind or whatever is that when you've got anything written in terms of complex numbers, you could rewrite it in terms of couples of real numbers. That's the way, perhaps, of viewing it. Okay. So... I've written down here, Hamilton avoided talking about imaginary quantities by dealing with pairs. The rules give an exact parallel to the rules for adding and multiplying complex numbers, but without introducing the mysterious square root of minus one. The logical development was to consider number triples 
or triadic fancies, as Hamilton called them. I told you he had a way with language. Not a very good way, but he had a way with language. He now looked at number triples such as ABC. I'm going to parallel what I did with the complex numbers until we run into trouble. He wanted to find rules for their addition and their multiplication. By analogy with complex numbers, he wrote them. We can, if you want, don't want to deal with the I and J that I'm going to introduce, you can just think in terms of triples, but the, the, um, it looks a lot messier. So by analogy with complex numbers, he wrote A plus BI plus CJ, where I squared is equal to J squared is equal to minus 1. The addition is easy. If you add two triples together, you just add the first entry, you add the second entries together, you add the third entries together, and I've got an example down there at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the slide. That's good, I was looking for the clock, I now realise it's exactly in front of me. Um, okay. But what about multiplying them? Okay. How could we define the product of two triples, 1 plus 2i plus 3j multiplied by 4 plus 5i plus 6j? Well, if you're going to multiply three terms, 1 plus 2i plus 3j by another two terms, 4 plus 5a plus 6j, then there's going to be nine answers coming up. We have, for example, the 1 times the 4, which gives you 4, the 2i times the 5i, which is 10i squared, but remember, i squared is minus 1, that gives you minus 10. 3j times the 6j, 3 sixes are 18, j squared, so it's therefore going to be minus 18. So that's the first term in brackets. Then let's collect the i's together. Um, we've got 1 times 5i, and we have 2i times 4. So we've got 5 plus 8i. Let's add the j's together. You get j by taking the 3j times 4, which gives you 12 of them, and by taking 1 times 6j, giving you 6 of them, 6, 12ij. And then the remaining two terms come from multiplying the 2i in the first bracket by the 6j in the second. That's giving you 12ij. And multiplying the 3j in the first by the 5i in the second. So you end up with another term, ij. So the obvious way of multiplying triples seems to go outside where you started with. It introduces another term, ij. And Hamilton thought about this problem for many years, he says on and off for 15 years, exploring different possibilities for the term ij. And in fact it became a something of a family joke, as we can read in this letter from Hamilton to one of his sons, Archibald, written many years later, shortly before his death, where Hamilton wrote, Every morning on my coming down to breakfast, your brother, William Edwin, and yourself used to ask me, Well, Papa, can you multiply triple, triplets? Whereto I was always obliged to reply with a sad shake of the head, No, I can only add and subtract them. Hamilton tried various values for ij, the ones I'm sure you're probably thinking of yourself, ij equal to 1 ij equal to minus 1, ij equal to 0. There were others, but they all failed because Hamilton wanted to construct a way of multiplying triples which had a property that the real numbers have and that the complex numbers have. This is a rule called the division law and it essentially says if you've got real numbers, you can divide any real number by any other non-zero real number. If you have a complex number, you can divide any complex number by any non-zero complex number. But in terms of multiplication, what this means, the division law means that if D and E, for example, are triples with D non-zero, we're going to divide by a non-zero thing, then there must be a triple X such that D multiplied by X equals E. So you can, multi you can find an X with that property, and we normally just say that means that D divides into E with the answer being x. So look at the examples down there. That's saying that if you take the number 3 and the number 17, you can divide 3 into 17. The answer is 17 over 3. It's saying if you take the complex number 1 plus i, you can divide that into the number. That shouldn't be 25. I changed that. That should just be 2. <laughs> In case, that should be 1 plus i times 1 minus i should be equal to 2. So that was the deliberate mistake. Hopefully the only deliberate mistake. Uh, <laughs> as you were probably checking there as I was doing it. Um, so, you want that property, so 
That's very important because that's a constraint in the kind of algebra that he wants to create that he's able to do division in it. And um, if that were a 2 there instead of 25, which is probably the main thing you remember when you leave the lecture, um, one knows that um, you can obtain this division thing if another property holds. For those of you who know more about complex numbers, you'll know that there's this thing called the modulus of complex number. And in fact, what I've done there is to multiply the complex number 1 plus i by its complex conjugate, and um, you end up with uh, 2, as I say, which is the modulus. Um, he was able to obtain, the crucial thing, he was able to obtain this division law if there was, if his multiplication satisfied another property called the law of the modulus. And the modulus of a triple, A, B, C, is just the square root, our old friend Pythagoras really, A squared plus B squared plus C squared. And he wanted his method of multiplication to have the following property. If it has this property, then division will follow. That the modulus of a product is equal to the product of the moduluses. So that if you've got two triples, you can take the modulus of each of them, Right. multiply those two moduluses together. On the other hand, you could mul multiply the triples and then take the modulus. You want those two answers to be the same. If your multiplication satisfies that, then you're able to have the law of division and everything is fine. And he couldn't get this with triples. And then one day, and it's not often we're able to say exactly the date and the time, um, 16th of October, 1843, Hamilton was walking along the Royal Canal in Dublin um, to the meeting of the Royal Irish Academy when, as he later wrote, this is another example of Hamilton's florid prose, an undercurrent of thought was going on in my mind which gave me at last a result, whereof it is not too much to say that I felt it was once the importance. An electric circuit seemed to close and a spark, a spark splashed forth the herald, as I foresaw immediately of many long years to come, of definitely directed thought and work by myself, if spurred, and at all events on the part of others, if I ever should be allowed to live long enough directly to communicate the discovery. I pulled out on the spot a pocket book, and that's the pocket book on the left, which still exists, and made an entry there and then. Nor could I result, nor could I resist the impulse, unphilosophical as it might be have been, to cut with a knife on a stone on Broom Bridge as we passed it, the fundamental formula with the symbols I, J and K, namely I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals I, J, K equals minus one, which contains the solution to the problem. So no carving on the walls as you leave, writing on the walls as you leave the the theatre. I always wondered why he did that, and it was only when I found the full quote, which I've given to you, although it's quite hard to read because the sentences are so long, the sentence where he says, many long years to come of definitely directed thought and work by myself if spurred, and at all events on the part of others, if I should ever be allowed to live long enough distinctly to communicate the discovery. Hamilton was a compulsive scribbler, is another reason. According to his son, if there was no paper available, he would write on his fingernails, or if at breakfast, scribble on his hard-boiled egg. <laughs> well, what did he see in the flash of inspiration? Instead of triples, he added another term, k, which also satisfied k squared equals minus 1, giving him quadruples, or as he called them, quaternions. In fact, Hamilton's quest for a way to multiply triples that satisfied the division law was doomed to failure. This was proven by the German mathematician Frobenius 13 years after Hamilton's death, when Frobenius showed that the only possible real associative division algebras were the real numbers themselves, the complex numbers, and the quaternions. There are only three of them that have the division property that I was telling you about. So instead of triples, he was working with quaternions, quadruples, A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, on which he has the relationships, I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals IJK equals minus one. And I want to show you that this, this is a different kind of algebra from any that was created before because it's not commutative. We'll see, for example, that IJ is not equal to JI, 
but is equal to minus ji. And let me try to illustrate this, starting off with uh, that identity up there. Suppose we take ijk equal to minus 1, that relationship there. And what we do is we multiply on the right, both sides on the right, by the factor k, by the number k, k and k. You get ij k squared is equal to minus k. But we know that k squared is minus 1. So minus ij, the minus 1, minus ij equals minus k, so ij is equal to k. On the other hand, let's start with the same relation, ijk equals minus 1. But this time, multiply it on the left by the term j times i. So then I've multiplied on the left, ji, and on the other side by ji as well. But look in here, we've got a little i squared nestled in, but we know that i squared is minus 1. So that is the same as minus jjk equals minus ji. But we know that j squared is minus 1, so we obtain that k is equal to minus ji. So we have that ij is equal to k, but k is equal to minus ji. So ij is equal to minus ji. And Hamilton's great insight, and it's very hard for us to appreciate it now, was to sacrifice commutivity. He was sacrificing the fact that ij is equal to ji. Very counterintuitive at the time, and very different from any other algebraic system that he was aware of. And still end up with a consistent and meaningful algebra. Well then, everything comes, falls out, if we go to how to multiply two quaternions together, a plus bi plus cj plus dk by another one, w plus xi plus yj plus zk, there's going to be 4 times 4, there are going to be 16 terms when you multiply it all out, and you're going to have terms involving i squared, j squared and k squared, but you're also going to have i k and k i and j k and k j, and this little cyclical diagram tells you how you can do the multiplication, if you write them in a, a circle like so, i, j, and k, and you go around clockwise, then the rule for multiplication is that i, j gives you k, j, k gives you i, k, i gives you j. That's what happens when you go clockwise, when you go anti-clockwise, it's just a handy mnemonic for being able to remember it. If you go anti-clockwise, we get k, j is minus i, j, i is minus k, and then i, k is minus j. So that enables you to do the multiplication of these quadruples, these um, quaternions. And they obey all the usual laws of arithmetic apart from the commutative law and was exceptionally important in the development of abstract algebra. And Hamilton was so pleased with this discovery that he wrote a poem about it. And how the one of time of space the three might in the chain of symbols girdle be. And although they did not become the powerful and widespread tool that Hamilton hoped they would be, Wachternians were, however, important in the development, some of you, but not those at college, will have met yet, the development of vector analysis, which was more powerful in mathematical physics. But Hamilton used the notation of scalar part for the term, it's time in the poem, it's the first entry, the A that doesn't involve i, j, and k. And vector part for the terms that do, the terms that do involve i, j, and k. And then it turns out that, um, so the first part is where I'm, what I've just said, it has a scalar part and a vector part. And if you take two quaternions with no um, scalar parts, and you multiply them together, according to the rules that I gave you on a slide or two back, then for those who, who know about it, the scalar part of the quaternion Q1 multiplied by the quaternion Q2. It's the negative of the dot product of the two vectors. In vector analysis, you've got two ways of multiplying a dot product and a vector product. And the quaternion captures both of them because the vector part of quaternion 1 multiplied by quaternion 2 is the vector product of the vectors Q1 and Q2. So it holds both of those things inside it. And quaternions, they're still of use in certain applications, for example, this was, I think, textbook this year or last year in quaternions for computer graphics, 
because they can be used to achieve the transformation of any directed line in three dimensions to any other directed line. And that's why they're using computer graphics. So they overcome, apparently, various issues, such as gimbal lock in computer graphics of rotating points in three-dimensional space. All right. So let me turn now to the other um, influential mathematician in the middle of the century. And he's the English-born George Bull. And the early 1840s were an important period in his life as well. Hamilton discovered quaternions in 1843. In 1844, the 29-year-old Bull was awarded the first gold medal for mathematics from the Royal Society. This was an impressive achievement, particularly because Bull was essentially a self-taught mathematician. He was born into a poor family in Lincoln. His father was a shoemaker, leaving school at the age of 16 and not able to afford to go to university. He taught himself languages, philosophy and mathematics. When his father's business failed, he supported his family by teaching, eventually opening his own school in Lincoln. He started to publish his mathematical researches and it was his work on applying algebraic methods to the solution of differential equations that brought him the award of the Royal Society Gold Medal. In 1849, Boyle was appointed, a Bull, Bull was appointed as the first professor of mathematics in Ireland's newly founded Queen's College at Cork, now called University College Cork. He worked there until his death at the early age of 49. He married Mary Everest, a niece of Sir George Everest, after whom the world's highest mountain is named. They had five daughters, the middle one of this year becoming a mathematician. Now, Bull was particularly interested in representing the workings of the human mind in symbolic form. And his major work on the subject was his 1854 book, An Investigation of the Laws of Thought, on which are founded the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities. And on the left, there's uh, the title page. And at its start, he writes, The design of the following treatise is to investigate the fundamental laws of those operations of the mind by which reasoning is performed to give expression to them in the symbolic language of a calculus. A calculus is just something that you calculate with. And upon this foundation, to establish the science of logic and construct its method. And he also applied his uh, techniques to probability. He was very proud of this work, I think rightly so, and wrote, I'm now about to set seriously to work upon preparing for the press an account of my theory of logic and probabilities, which in its present state I look upon as the most valuable, if not the only viable, valuable contribution that I have made or am likely to make to science, and the thing by which I would desire, if at all, to be remembered hereafter. Well, he got that wish anyway. <coughs> now, in the laws of thought, he approached logic in a new way. This is a new way of looking at logic reducing it to a simple algebra, incorporating logic into mathematics. He did this by applying algebraic operations on entities that had not previously been thought of as part of mathematics. Entities that had not previously been thought of as part of mathematics. These entities were classes of objects with particular properties. For example, he wrote, this is his example, that the symbol X denote the class of all white things. Let the symbol Y denote the class of all sheep. Then he used the compound symbol XY to denote the class of all white sheep. We now think of it in terms of set theory, where we interpret XY as the intersection of the set of white things with the set of sheep. And he continued, if Z denotes the class of all horned things, then ZXY is all horned white sheep. More agricultural, perhaps, than today's examples. <laughs> so let's see some of the laws that this composition satisfied. If you're even happy at the moment, you've already reached a level of abstraction as it takes a lot of people a long time to get to. So what we've done is we've introduced objects, X, Y, classes of things with certain properties. 
we've got a way of combining two of them to obtain a third. If you x is all white things, y is all sheep, then xy is going to be all white sheep. So we've got a way of combining two of the entities to get a third. Okay? So let's look and see what properties this combination has. And we see that, again, if x is all white things and y is all sheep, then xy is equal to yx. Why? Because the left-hand side, according to the way that I defined it, the class of all white things that are sheep is the same as the class of all sheep that are white. So the algebra that we're developing is commutative. So it's just these entities behave the same as numbers do with regard to this law of combining them. But there is something different. Now for something completely different. If every member of a class X, say being a man, is also a member of a class Y, say being human, then we have XY is equal to X. Now remember what XY is, it's just those things that belong to both of them. And if every um, thing in X, which is a man, is also a human, is also in Y, then the intersection of X and Y is equal to X. And in the special case, when x and y are the same, xx is equal to x. So on the left-hand side, it's a saying things like, that's the class of all white, white sheep. And on the right-hand side, you have the class of all white sheep. Repeating the adjective doesn't make the sheep any more or less white. So what you have here is that for any class, and mimicking what happens in arithmetic we write x times x is x squared you get that x squared is equal to x for all classes x now this is a very different from result from what you get in arithmetic in arithmetic x squared equals x only for the num two numbers only for the number zero and only for the number one in this boolean algebra what we get is x squared is equal to x for every entity and that's not surprising because the entities are very different from um, are very different from numbers. Okay. Bull defined another way of combining classes, which he wrote as plus. And again, what he wants to do is a way of combining two classes, which he's calling plus, to give you a third class. And um, if x and y are classes, then x plus y denotes the class of all objects which belong either to class X or to class Y. And originally, Bull only did it for classes that were mutually exclusive, that had no elements in common. But uh, later mathematicians extended the definition to deal, with, to deal with all classes. So, for example, if X is the class of all women, is that the one I'm doing? Yes. Y is the class of all men, then X plus Y is the class of all humans. And once again, we've got commutivity because x plus y is equal to y plus x. And we have other results that we see in arithmetic. If you look, I've given one of them down there. z times x plus y is equal to zx times zy. Because look and see what you've got on the left-hand side. x plus y is the class of all humans. And z times x plus y, if z is the class of Europeans, z times x plus y is going to be the class of all European humans. Whereas on the right-hand side, you've got the plus. Um, Zx is the class of European women. Zy is the class of European men. So on the right-hand side, you've got the class of things that are either European women or European men. So exactly the same. So you've got many of the laws of arithmetic go across, but some of them don't. In particular, the x squared is equal to x. Now let me... Uh, just one thing here, just to get our, just, just to use some of the manipulation. Um, he denoted one to mean the universal class. He denoted zero uh, to denote the empty class. So that, again, if we have this example of x being all white things, then one minus x will be the class of all things that are not white. Now, something cannot simultaneously be white and not white. So that means that x times one minus x is going to be zero. Nothing can be white and not white at the same time. And then if you use the rule I had on the previous slide to multiply in, you get x minus x squared is equal to zero, and rearranging that, you get x squared equals x as before. Mainly just doing this as an example that you can sort of do algebra with these things. You've got a way of combining the multiplication with the addition 
um, together. All right, let me give you just one example of it before going on to my final section. And this is really truly amazing once you get time to think about it. The major impact of the laws of thought was Bull's purely symbolic and manipulation of classes. Look at the first four lines uh, below the title at the top on symbolic algebra. We want to demonstrate in Bull's notation to show how it can just be derived algebraically the classical implication. If all A's are B and all B's are C, therefore all A's are C. Let me say that in a more expanded way. If everything in class A has got the property B, and everything with the property B has got the property C, then the implication goes across everything with property A also has property C. So if every A is a B, and every B is a C, therefore all A's are C. But let's see how that can be demonstrated, how that can be represented in Bull's logic. So in Bull's logic, the hypothesis, um, I'm setting up some notation here, let little a equal the class of all a's, let little b equal the class of all b's, let little c equal the class of all c's. So in Bull's notation, the hypothesis is that everything that belongs to class little a also belongs to class little b can be written as a equals ab. Because remember, I had that thing before. If something belongs to little a, it also belongs to little b, so a is going to be equal to ab. And similarly, if everything that belongs to little b also belongs to little c, there we are there, we've got b equals bc. So the premises that we have are given by those two equations there, relating the two sets or relating the classes. But now we just go purely algebraically. A is equal to AB, but now I substitute for B. B is equal to BC. So you've got A equals AB equals ABC. Now I pull the A and B together, but the AB is equal to A. So you get A is equal to AC. Now if A is equal to AC, it tells you that everything that is in class A also belongs to class C. Because if you have something in and over here, it also belongs to the intersection of A and C, so it also belongs to C. So all A's are C. And what you have now is a way of being able to work with logic purely symbolically, um, rather than using words or other type of an approach. And it was exceptionally very, very powerful. And I thought it was difficult to sort of impress that upon you, so what I thought I'd do, just to finish, was to show you a similar kind of thing um, in a very practical situation um, developed by the mathematician Claude Shannon. So the, the point I want to take away is that Boolean algebra can perform logical deductions using routine algebraic calculations. They are routine algebraic calculations. This thing down here is totally mechanical. <coughs> Once you can set the premises up symbolically, you can work through the symbolic manipulations that you can do upon them to obtain certain conclusions. Okay. So you can set your intelligence aside. So I want to finish by showing how Claude Shannon analysed electrical circuits using ideas similar to those of Bill. And Claude Shannon was an American mathematician, electrical engineer and cryptographer. He's possibly best known as the founder of information theory, which he created in the late 1940s. But I want to tell you about some of the earlier work um, done while he was a student at MIT, that marvellous period at MIT in the 1930s. And this work implied symbolic logic, which was essentially the creation of Boole, to problems in electrical circuit switching, and so laid the foundations of the circuitry principles underlying the logic of computer design. Shannon's master thesis, submitted in 1936, and that's it on the right, the cover sheet for it, was entitled A Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits. And in it, he looked at two general problems with many examples. It's very readable, it's obtainable on the web. You just Google Claude Shannon, 1936, Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits. And I like this one, I've taken my examples from the actual thesis because when you look at it, I think he had to change typewriters at least twice while he was writing it. 
Um, he looked at two general problems. The first was to analyse a given electrical circuit and in particular try to simplify it. The other problem was to try to construct an electrical circuit with given characteristics. His approach was to represent a circuit by an equation representing the structure of the circuit. He then simplifies the equation for the circuit using rules exactly analogous to those he used in symbolic logic. Let me show you how he represented an electrical circuit by an equation. So this will be our, our first step. All right. And as I say, the details are not too crucial. But essentially what we're going to do is to analyse when currents can and cannot flow. You know when they can and cannot flow say, through one circuit, you know when they can and cannot flow through another circuit, and you put them together in various ways and it asks how the combination behaves. So his setup was he introduced a term called the hindrance. The hindrance between two points A and B in a circuit is zero if current can flow. So there's zero hindrance means the current can flow. If the hindrance is zero, current can flow, and one otherwise. So if the hindrance is one, a current can't flow. So I've got examples, I've got his diagrams down here in the middle and uh, my text describing something about them here. So if that's switch A and B between these two little nodes here, if that's switch XAB between them is closed, the hindrance is zero because current can flow. And if the switch is open, the hindrance is one and current cannot flow. Now he looks at putting things together. He introduces a way of combining two switches, two circuits, called plus. And if the two, if x and y are in series, he writes that as x plus y. So if two circuits are in series, that's his plus operation. The hindrance of two switches, x and y in series, he writes as x plus y. All right, that's his operation. So whenever you see plus from now on, you think in series. What about the other way of putting things together? The um, first half of his thesis is concerned with series in parallel and uh, sorry, in series and in parallel. And if they're in parallel, here X and Y are in parallel, you see that if X is closed, current can flow in here along the upper limb and then out again. If Y is closed, it can flow under the uh, lower limb and then out again. Well, what he does is he writes the hindrance of two switches, x and y in parallel, is written x times y. So his operation of multiplication is for when you put things, when you put things in parallel. So when I multiply now, you think parallel. When I add, you think series. He then develops lots of very obvious postulates. It's when you, you see it, you think, hey, I could have done that if I'd have been around in 1936. <laughs> uh, a closed circuit in series with an open circuit is an open circuit. You know, if you a closed circuit in parallel with an open circuit is a closed circuit because you can flow along one of the limbs. Right? And various self-obvious things like that when you patch the two of them together. And then he just writes them out for All the various combinations of x added onto y, it's commutative, x times y, it's also commutative. Um, you have this associative law. So these are the laws for the hindrances and the things that they satisfy. And the proof of them is not even very difficult. He uses a method he calls perfect induction, which is x and y can only take two values, 0 or 1. So he just tries every possible value on each side of the equations and shows that they always give the same answer. So, but tedious, but as long as you stay awake, it's fine. <laughs> All right, so now let's go to it and apply it. So this is the first example he gives. He applies it to this circuit down here. An example of the simplification of expressions, consider the circuit shown in figure five. All right, so let's start working from the left. Here we've got W, and it's in series with something. Series means plus. What's it in series with? It's in series with things in parallel. Things in parallel mean multiply. So it's going to be W plus W dash multiplied by, oh, they're in series, X plus Y. In series with something else. So plus, what's the something else they're in series with? Oh, they're in series with things that are in parallel. So it's going to be 
x plus y, because they're in series. Yeah, x, sorry, thank you. x plus z, um, multiplied by, sorry, I lost it. Uh, well, yeah, multiplied by s plus w dash plus z, uh, multiplied by, up here. So w plus w dash times x plus y, because that couple there are in parallel. Um, onto the big one down here, they're in parallel, x plus z, uh, in parallel with three things in series, s plus w dash plus z, and with these things up here, you've got the z dash in series with the y, in series with a pair in parallel, s dash times v. So you can do that. I mean, it's way passing the time. And but you get a series, you can write that down. And then you have, on the back of your sheet of paper, you have these. All right? And you noticed on this thing here, there were lots of things that you could multiply out. Now, you've stopped thinking at this point. You're just multiplying out. You're using the rules that are being given. And when you go down through it, I put one of the steps and I think, yeah, I did a partial simplification up for you. And then you come down to that. So the thing is, the series that we started off with had a certain circuit representation, algebraic representation, which we manipulated using the laws to get to a simplified form as this. This series is going to have exactly the same circuit behaviour. It's going to have the same circuit behaviour as the one we started off with. And we can fabricate this because it is W plus, that means a W in series with an X, in series with a Y, in series with three things in parallel. So the thing that we had before, we started off with a complicated circuit, we wrote down its equation in terms of pluses and multiplies, we operated on it with the laws in order to um, simplify it, and then when we had the simplified thing, we could reconstruct it like this. And you might be able to, to see that the thing lends itself to mechanisation so, so easily. And he did other things as well, uh, which was to write down um, a, a similar sort of way of being able to construct series in order to be able to construct circuits that had particular properties. Okay. So I wanted to give that one to you because I think hopefully that's, although I know the details were coming thick and fast, to give you an approach of the symbolic approach of how you can tackle that kind of a problem. And I think you hopefully get the, the feel for it anyway. So, just finishing then. Um, it was Bull's 200th birthday earlier this month on the 2nd of November. And you may have seen that Google marked it with the Google Doodle, the Google Doodle, which is that if um, uh, you have the, uh, of the G, the, the uh, second G in Google, X or Y, well, what happens when I run the animation, hope in the moment, um, it depends on whether both X and Y are there. If they're both there, as in this particular thing, the big G lights up because that's the Boolean condition that both X and Y are true. Um, uh, the X or Y also lights up. So let me see if it runs. So the X and Y, there, there's just the X. So various ones are lighting up depending upon whether you have X on its own, Y on its own, both X and Y, or neither of X and Y. So I think quite a nice little illustration of it. And another memorial to him is the stained glass window in Cork. And here you see Bull at the bottom sharing the window with Aristotle and with Euclid, two distinguished logicians. Uh, distinguished company indeed. And the right is the plaque on the bridge where Hamilton scratched his formula for quaternions um, in his unphilosophical moment. And the memorials mark the work of two mathematicians who can fairly be said to have liberated algebra from the constraints of arithmetic. And you can find out more at um, David Wilkins' very fine website about Hamilton, um, and the URL is in the, the handout, and also Des McHale has republished uh, an expanded uh, biography of George Bull just out this year in order to, to meet the anniversary. So my next lecture is on um, Babbage and Lovelace, Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace on Tuesday the 19th of January and perhaps I can be the first one to wish you all a happy Christmas. <laughs> Thank you.